Hi, my name is Ana Feijão. I'm a cardiac sonographer working in Angola, and I'm here to give you some tips to apply in your echocardiography exams. I apologize for my English, which is not the best, but I will try to speak slowly. After releasing some videos with the basic concepts of performing the transthoracic echo, I received feedback with questions related to the practical part. This is how this project came about, approaching the step-by-step -step of an echocardiographic study in order to answer the various questions that arose. Now I work in a cardiology department at a private medical center with a Mindray DC70 and I'm ready to give you tips and guidelines to optimize your echocardiographic study and get excellent diagnosis from it. Okay, let's start. This is the second video in a series of videos where I explain step by step a normal echocardiographic study. In the previous video, I talked about the long axis parasternal view and in this video, I will talk about the short-axis parasternal view. After evaluating the long-axis parasternal view, I step to the short-axis parasternal incidence. From the position where I am with the probe, I rotate the transducer mark to the patient's left arm. That is, I keep the transducer in the same position, but I rotate it in a clockwise direction. In this view, aligning the probe towards the head, upper, or towards the feet, lower, we cut the heart in slices, like we see in this image here. And each slice that we cut is a degree of tilt that we make with the probe. Normally, I start at the top. I tilt the probe towards the head or neck of the patient and stop when I get this image. This view is called the parasternal short axis at the level of the great vessels. In this incidence, we can see the aortic valve in the middle with the three cusps, the pulmonary artery with its main branch here, bifurcating in the left branch and in the right branch. Here, the pulmonary valve the right ventricle with the right ventricle outflow chamber, free wall here, and the inlet chamber of the right ventricle. The tricuspid valve, where we can see the septal leaflet here, and more anteriorly, the anterior or inferior leaflet. The right atrium here, the interatrial septum here, the left atrium here, and finally the descending aorta here. We must orient the focus and the gain ramp according to the bidimensional grayscale variations and we improve the image with small tilts. As it is an incidence with so many structures, we may have to make small tilts on the probe to better define the exact area that we want to study. We are not always able to have a perfect image with all the structures well visualized, so the ideal is to start by evaluating step by step. Personally, I start by evaluating the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary valve. So, I center the structures and access the valve first. When the pulmonary cusps are very thin, they are not noticeable in systole, but we can clearly see the closing zone. Some people pass the M-mode cursor over the valve because in some pathologies, the leaflet mobilization pattern varies 
and the M mode is a good instrument to evaluate. But I confess that I do not include this evaluation in my day-to-day -day practice. After evaluating the mobility of the pulmonary valve, I pay attention to the main pulmonary branch and the right and left branches. In this image, the bifurcation is not very noticeable as there seems to be a membrane between the main branch here. So if you tilt the probe a little, uh, it will adjust and we'll be able to see the continuity from the main branch to the secondary branch. I access the walls and do some tilts with the probe to see if there are no strange echogenic images, especially in the lumen. To finalize the evaluation of this area, I add some color. First, I access the flow of the pulmonary valve. I call the color Doppler window, lower the general 2D gains, orient the size of the sector so that the pulmonary valves uh, in the middle, and orient the color scale to a velocity around 50 to 70 centimeters per second. With very low color Doppler velocities, we are setting a low limit for aliasing. That is, visually, we will not have as good a perception of the flow dynamics as with higher velocities. But being uh, in a cardiac zone with low velocities, it is also advisable not to set very high velocities as we lose track if there is any flow altered at low velocities. After improving the 2D image and color with the necessary commands, we evaluate the systolic flow and diastolic flow well. It is common to find this flame here in diastole, which corresponds to pulmonary regurgitation. The length of regurgitation is directly related to its severity. It is important to bear in mind that to access regurgitation, we must make small tilts on the probe and leave the plane. It's called off-axis planes. In other words, we leave the plane defined by theory and look for a three-dimensional image of the regurgitation. This is because the jet can be more exuberant in a plane than the one we are observing, and these small tilts allow us to have this notion of three-dimensionality of the flow. We must then place the color window over the pulmonary branch, including the secondary branches, to access the behavior of the flow. We have an example here in B video. We can see a very turbulent flow with an anterior direction that is going up through the main branch of the pulmonary artery, starting at the level of the bifurcation and which is constant through the diastole and cardiac systole. This flow corresponds to a patent ductus arteriosus. Continuing, then I place the CW cursor over the valve. Pulmonary velocities are low enough to not suffer aliasing with PW Doppler, but I prefer to use CW. But it is important to have the notion that in the evaluation of pulmonary velocities, in the absence of stenosis, PW Doppler can be used. Then I orient the cursor through the color Doppler flow and call up the spectral graph. I'm going to have a graph that looks like this in D. A triangular curve, negative, because it's a flow that goes away from the probe. I must calculate the maximum velocity that corresponds to the maximum velocity of the flow of the pulmonary valve an important parameter for us to understand if there is stenosis when the flow passes from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery.
If there is stenosis, we have to access whether it is below the valve, subvalvular, on the valve itself, valvular stenosis, or above the valve, supravalvular stenosis. This analysis can be done with the help of a pulse Doppler, placing the sample from the cursor at various points on the turbulent flow line in order to understand when we have a transition from a normal laminar flow to a turbulent flow and thus understand where the obstruction really is. Whenever we activate the spectral graph, remember that it is important to orient the baseline and the velocity scale in order to visualize the peak of the curve to be studied. And we must also orient the gains and filters so that the entire spectral curve is well defined. To calculate the maximum velocity of the pulmonary valve flow, we must choose the pulmonic valve menu and choose PV max submenu, meaning pulmonary valve maximum velocity. A caliper is automatically generated and we must place the caliper at the maximum speed tip, right here. If we want to calculate the mean gradient, we must call the submenu PV VTY, which means pulmonic valve velocity time integral. A caliper is also generated automatically and with it we must contour the triangular shape of the flow. From the beginning of systole velocity here, to the end of the flow here. This evaluation, in addition to the maximum gradient calculated by the maximum velocity, also gives us information about the average gradient. Then we should evaluate the regurgitant flow with continuous Doppler. I place the CW cursor over the valve and guide the cursor through the regurgitant flow. Following the normal steps, I call the spectral graph, orient the baseline and velocity scales so that we can visualize the peak of the curve to be studied. And we must also orient the gains and filters so that the entire spectral curve is well defined. I will remind you of these precautions through the various videos. The curve corresponding to the pulmonary regurgitation is a curve like this one in C, with a diastolic slope here, that the slower it is, the less severe the regurgitation will be. It is a positive curve as it is a flow approaching to the probe. And then we must calculate the tele-diastolic speed, which through a formula will allow us to perceive whether the pulmonary pressure are normal or high. Another flow that is important to evaluate is the right ventricle outflow track flow. I keep the color Doppler window uh, as it is, okay? Don't move it as to evaluate a specific zone, the right ventricle outflow chamber, I choose pulse Doppler PW, okay? When activating the PW command, a cursor is called automatically and I align it with the systolic flow. I set the sample to four millimeters or less and place it five to 10 millimeters before the pulmonary valve. Okay, very important. You can see in the image uh, above here is the pulmonary valve and the pulse Doppler sample is placed before the cusps here. Okay, then I call up the spectral graph by pressing the PW command again. I'm going to have a graph that looks like this. Also a triangular curve, negative, because it's a flow away from the probe. 
It may happen that we have a vertical spike at the beginning of the curve called the closing click, which suggests correct placement of the sample. As in the previous one, whenever we activate the spectral graph, it is important to orient the baseline and the velocity scale in order to visualize the peak of the curve to be studied. And we must also orient the gains and filters so that the entire spectral curve is well defined. Here I must calculate the peak time, which goes from the beginning of the curve to the peak, and the total ejection time, which goes from the beginning of the curve to the end of the curve. These parameters will help in the assessment of pulmonary pressures. To calculate them, access the pulmonic valve menu again and choose the RVET submenu, meaning right ventricle ejection time, and PVACCT, meaning pulmonary valve acceleration time. These parameters help to access pulmonary pressures. Okay, in case of increased pulmonary pressures, the difference between the gradients will be large enough to cause a rapid rise in the flow velocity. That is, measuring from the beginning of systole, here, to the pressure peak, if it takes less than 100 milliseconds, it is a sign that the pulmonary pressures are more likely to be increased. Another calculation that we can do is dividing peak acceleration time of the systolic curve by the total ejection time. If it is less than 0.3, it is a sign that the probability of increased pulmonary pressures is higher. Pulmonary valve and pulmonary branches checked, okay, I move on to the analysis of the aortic valve. The aortic valve appears in the center. Sometimes it is difficult to get a good shot to get the three cusps at the same time in systole, but we must do our best to get that image. The first thing to do is to access the opening of the cusps, their morphology, already seen in the longitudinal axis, thickness, and, very important, the number of cusps present. As we can see here in this image, we have the right coronary cusp more anteriorly, the non-coronary cusp here, and finally the left coronary cusp here. Don't forget that in diastole, with the cusps closed, we can confuse the presence of a ref as being a cusp, or the calcification in one cusp can look like there are two or, or more, and uh, we normally we identify the number of the cusps in systole, okay? When open, we realize there is only one cusp or uh, uh, when we think that was more than one. Then, we must put color on top of the valve to access the area of the regurgitant jet and its origin. I call the color Doppler window, lower the general 2D gains, adjust the size of the sector in order to place the aortic valve in the middle and be able to evaluate the flow well. And then I orient the color scale to a speed around 70 cm per second. After working the commands in order to have a good definition of the flow, I evaluate how it behaves. It is not an easy view, taking into account that the ultrasounds are perpendicular to the aortic flow, and, but we we can see in this video with color that even with this transversality we can understand the behavior of the flow. It is a good view, especially, to understand how regurgitation behaves as we can see where it originates and the diameter of the regurgitant orifice.
Okay, next I evaluate the tricuspid valve. I can see the leaflets well, their coaptation, if they open well or not, if they are uh, of normal thickness. And in this view, we evaluate the anterior leaflet here and the septal leaflet here. I then access the diastolic flow of the tricuspid valve. Although it is not a routine measurement, it is important to know how to evaluate and what to evaluate. So I call the color Doppler window, lower the general 2D gains and orient the sector size so that the tricuspid valve is in the middle and be able to access the flow well. I orient the color scale to a speed around 50 cm per second to have a good flow definition. In this case, I adjust the color scale to 70 cm per second in order to best define the flow. Next, I place the PW Doppler cursor at the tip of the open tricuspid valve leaflets and adjust the sample to about 1 to 3 millimeters. That is, I adjust the sample, these two dashes here in the cursor, in order to be in front of the tricuspid leaflets when they are open. And finally, I call the spectral graph, loading again in PW command. The spectral graph will have this presentation. A flow with two waves, one representative of the rapid filling of the ventricle, the E wave, and the second wave representative of atrial contraction called the A wave. As you can see, relating the flow to the electrocardiogram, the A wave falls a little after the P wave. The P wave represents electrical atrial systole that transforms into mechanical atrial systole milliseconds later, thus causing the second ejection flow from the atrium to the ventricle. We must measure the maximum speed of E wave and A wave and measure the deceleration time, this ramp. It is normal for the flow to have a certain respiratory variation, which is why the guidelines state that we should take these measurements either at the end of expiration or average them over a respiratory cycle. If necessary, you can lower the sweep speed in order to have more cycles in a single graph. But if you do, go back to the sweep speed of 50 mm per second to evaluate the deceleration time as it has more definition of the flow ramp. To assess tricuspid regurgitation. I keep the color Doppler window on top to access the regurgitation. The important thing in tricuspid regurgitation, in addition to accessing the behavior of the color mosaic caused by the regurgitation flow by color Doppler, is also having a good alignment to calculate the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. How is pulmonary artery systolic pressure calculated? To calculate systolic pressure in the pulmonary artery is important to calculate the exact pulmonary artery systolic pressure. <laughs> but the echocardiogram allows us to calculate an approximate value. And knowing an approximate value of pulmonary artery systolic pressure, we can suspect of pulmonary hypertension by echocardiogram. This value is calculated by measuring the gradient, that is the difference in pressure between the right ventricle and the right atrium during systole. 
and I can get to it by measuring the velocity of the flow that exists between these two chambers during systole. And this flow is the tricuspid regurgitation. I already have the color Doppler window over the tricuspid valve. I place the CW cursor aligned with regurgitation and press the CW button again to bring up the spectral plot. And I will have this presentation. The flow of tricuspid regurgitation has rounded appearance and is negative. It is a negative flow because it moves away from the probe. The probe is up here, as I said, and the flow of tricuspid regurgitation represents the passage of blood from the right ventricle here to the right atrium in this direction. I emphasize again that whenever we activate the spectral graph, it is important to orient first the baseline, next the velocity scale, so that we can visualize the peak of the curve to be studied, and the Doppler gains and filters so that the entire spectral curve is well defined. Next, I calculate the maximum value of the right ventricle to right atrium velocity here. To find the pulmonary artery systolic pressure value, I just have to add the pressure value of the right atrium Okay, and you ask how you calculate pressure value of the right atrium. We obtain this value according to the inferior vena cava diameter and respiratory cinetics. But I will talk about this when I talk about inferior vena cava in the subcostal view. Finally, I would just like to make you aware that the spectral graph of the flow of tricuspid regurgitation does not always have a well-defined presentation. And it is important that the maximum velocity of regurgitation is measured in a well-delineated stream. And this Doppler flow definition depends a lot on the severity of the regurgitation. The more flow, the denser the spectral curve will be. And the jacked orientation, of course, don't forget that for any Doppler calculation, the alignment of the cursor with, with the flow direction is very, very important. If by chance you don't have a good curve where you can calculate a certain maximum speed, like in this example, mention that in your report. For example, mild tricuspid regurgitation without definition of spectral graph to conclude on a value of the systolic pressure of the pulmonary artery. And in these cases, we can then access to the flow of the right ventricular outflow track, as we mentioned earlier, to check the pulmonary pressure. It is better to do this than to underestimate or overestimate pulmonary artery systolic pressure and lead to a misdiagnosis. So, continuing. We already have evaluated the morphology of the tricuspid valve leaflets. We have already evaluated the regurgitation by color Doppler and we have already calculated the maximum gradient of the regurgitant flow. So, let's evaluate the right atrium. First, check the cavity, the atrium walls, if there is any image that shouldn't be there. It is a good incidence to visualize some anatomic variants. Anatomic variants are particularly common in the right atrium. During cardiac development, the formation of the crista terminalis and the eustachian valve is highly variable and can be manifested in a spectrum of vestiges, such as Chiari network, exuberant eustachian valve, the inferior vena cava's valve, exuberant Tibesian valve, the coronary sinus valve, and a prominent crista terminalis. Eustachian valve 
appears as free-floating curvilinear structure that waves with blood flow in right atrium. Chiari network, which are filamentous images that appear inside the atrium, that result from an incomplete resorption of the embryonic sinus venuses is a variant of eustachian valve. A part of Chiari network arises from the orifice of the inferior vena cava, like eustachian valve, but Chiari network is much more mobile and thinner and it may be confused for tricuspid vegetation, flail tricuspid valve, free right atrium thrombus, and pedunculated tumors. Crista terminalis is a well-defined fibromuscular ridge with similar echogenicity with adjacent myocardium, located at the posterolateral wall of right atrium near the superior vena cava. Finally, we evaluate the right ventricle. The cavity in the right ventricle outflow tract in the area anterior to the pulmonary cusps and inflow area just in front of the tricuspid valve. We also evaluate the thickness of the three wall. This is a good view to measure right ventricular free wall thickness and its contractility. The exuberance of the moderator band, and we can also remeasure the right ventricle in this incidence. The measurement should be taken from the anterior wall of the ventricle or free wall, not including the wall, to the aortic valve in telediastole. So, we have the peristernal short axis view evaluated at the level of the great vessels. We move on to the other peristernal short axis cuts. The peristernal short axis view, as I said earlier, is based on views resulting from cross sections of the heart, as if we cut the heart into slices. And this slice at the level of the great vessels is the one that takes the most work in terms of evaluation. Scanning through the other levels, the evaluation is more subjective and faster. <laughs> and this sweep is done with small tilts of the probe, as if we were scanning from the upper level, basal level in A, to the apical tip, lower level, here in C. Important things to take into account. In addition to the great vessels incidents that we spoke in previous slides, there are three very important levels to register and record. The basal level, where we see the mitral leaflets opening like a fish's mouth. The mid level, where we see the papillary muscles, these two little circles here, and the apical level, when we fail to see the papillary muscles, where they disappear. Okay? The, the papillary muscles are muscles located in the ventricles and they prevent the inversion or prolapse of the leaflets of mitral valve on systole. In this cross section, we can see them with this rounded shape, with the same echogenicity as the ventricular myocardium, as if they were a protrusion into the ventricular cavity. Angling the probe, to the upper level, when we stop seeing the papillary muscles and the mitral valve leaflets appear, we know that we are at the basal level. In the same way, being in the mid-level with the papillary muscles present, if we angle the probe towards the lower level, after a certain angle, the papillary muscles disappear. Now, here we know then that we are at the apical level.
At the basal level, that is where we see the leaflets of the mitral valve, we must see how the leaflets behave, their opening, and the areas of calcification. In this view, we have the anterior leaflet here, larger than the posterior leaflet here, the commissures here and here, and in these examples, we can see the difference between a normal mitral valve and a stenosed one. The leaflets in B almost don't open and are very calcified. As you can see, in this very echogenic and shiny area here, representing the calcium attached to the leaflets and causing their restricted mobility. And at this level, we can also put color Doppler on top of the mitral valve to understand how the regurgitant flow behaves, above all to understand its origin. The relationship between the size of the right ventricle and the left ventricle, also called the eccentricity index, must be subjectively evaluated by eye or quantified by this index in this view. A right ventricle with the same size or larger than the left ventricle is not normal and needs to be investigated. In cases where there is pressure or volume overload in the right cavities, it is very common to see a peristernal short axis view like this, in which the septum is rectified. It is also important to know that we the way the septum behaves in systole and in diastole guides us to understand whether the right ventricle has pressure or volume overload. Also in this view, in medium level, we must evaluate the papillary muscles, their number and position. Left ventricle trabeculation must be absent or very discreet. Excessive trabeculation, often referred to as non-compacted myocardium, it is present in this form of fingers that enter inside the cavity. You can see they have a different presentation. As you can see, they have a morphological presentation different from the presentation of the papillary muscles. And with color Doppler, we can see that the color enters through the trabeculae. The peristernal short axis view is a perfect incident to assess the recesses, to assess the area where these recesses are located, and to see how the flow behaves in the middle of these recesses with the help of color Doppler. Multiple trabeculation is a characteristic of right ventricle and its pattern is highly variable. Very important in this incidence, we must evaluate the contractility very carefully. In this view, we assess to all segments of both ventricles. Knowing well the segmental division and territories of the coronary arteries is important for us to be able to interpret changes in segmental contractility. In patients with altered segmental contractility, it is also important to access the presence of images suggestive of thrombi. Here, in this first example, we can see the contractility of a normally functioning ventricle. In this second example, we have the case of a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy with global hypokinesia. You can see that the walls of the ventricle hardly contract. And here, at the anterior level, we can see this well-defined image, with an echogenicity relatively different from that of the myocardium, with well-defined contours, apparently adherent to the myocardial wall, without signs of irregularity or attached structures,
suggestive of adherent traumas. In these last two videos, I give you an example of a patient with an inferior infarction where we can see hypokinesia of the septal inferior wall and inferior wall at level of the basal segments, as well as hypokinesia at the apical inferior level. It is also important to be able to identify non ischemic segmental contractility alterations, as is the case of this synergic movement of the interventricular septum in patients with pacemaker or complete left bundle branch block. This video represents a normal heart for you to be able to compare and the right video you can see if you notice at the level of interventricular septum there is a kind of whip motion of the septum with thickening of this area not in agreement with the thickening of the contralateral wall. These alterations are easily detectable by this view, but it is important to know how to differentiate them from pathological segmental alterations. As well as myocardial alterations, such as aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms, it is the perfect incidence to make the differential diagnosis between the two to evaluate the entrance door and the behavior of the aneurysm cavity, possible ruptures, presence of thrombi, etc. In this example, we can see the entrance port of a subvalvular mitral aneurysm with the entrance port at lower basal level. Here, we can assess whether there is any thrombus inside the loca and by applying color Doppler on top, we can see the dynamics of the flow. In patients with difficult parasternal long axis window, in which it is not possible to measure the ventricular walls and cavities, well, this view allows us to do it here. In this cut, the thickness of the walls in their concentric shape are very perceptible. If by parasternal long axis, we were only able to measure the thickness of the septal wall and the posterior wall, also known as lateral inferior wall, in this view, we were able to measure all the walls of the ventricle. And we can also do the M mode evaluation following the step-by-step -step principle that I explained to you in the video about the parasternal long axis. I will make a refresh of the topic. So, the measurements must be taken just below the level of the tip of the mitral valve leaflets. The trick is to angle the probe up to the basal level, where we see the leaflets, and back angulating the probe down. When the leaflets disappear, that's where we have to place the M mode cursor. To measure the cavity, the caliper must be placed on top of the endocardium, the interface between the myocardium and the cavity. When measuring the thickness of the interventricular septum, we must be careful not to include the moderator band of the right ventricle. And when measuring the thickness of the posterior wall, don't forget, also known as inferolateral wall, we must be careful not to include the papillary muscle, chordae tendinia, or pericardium. In order to confirm whether a certain echo is part of the wall or if it belongs to another structure, that should not be included in the measurement. We must confirm it in two-dimensional in order to better understand the continuity of the structures and the echoes that we have to include or not in the measurement. We must pay attention to values, don't forget this. Realize if there is any measurement that is altered or that does not go against what we are subjectively analyzing and if we have this attention, we can always repeat it for a better orientation of the study.
finally, it is an incident that, by sweeping the entire heart, allows us to have an idea of the pericardial alterations in all their extension. In the first example, we can see a mild lateral posterior effusion. This more echogenic zone is the pericardium, here the myocardium, and between the pericardium and the myocardium we have this anechogenic zone that represents the pericardial effusion. In this central example we have a better sense of the effusion which is slightly larger than the first example. And here in C we can see these echogenic filaments inside the effusion which correspond to fibrin, thus suggesting an old and organized effusion. Here I finish the video on the parasternal short axis view. The next video will be about the apical view. I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments or email me. Thank you.